So today's lecture is on pollution. And we'll actually be covering different aspects of pollution throughout next week as well. So today we're starting pollution, but we're only going to get um, through so much. We're not going to cover a couple major classes of pollution. So you'll hear more about this. Um, this picture is pretty cool. It's actually an art installation to protest um, especially plastic bag pollution. Um, I thought it was really beautiful, so I threw in some plastic art. So the topics that we're going to cover today are marine pollution, and the types of marine pollution we're going to focus on today are um, POPs, which are persistent organic pollutants, and we'll learn about those, bioaccumulation of pollution, mercury and pesticides, and then plastic pollution and marine debris and ghost fishing. And I actually have two big activities for today. The first one's on plastic pollution. That one will I'll give you quite a bit of time for. And the second one is on marine debris and ghost fishing. You'll learn what that is, and I have a shorter activity for you on that. The learning goals for today are to understand that marine pollution is a growing problem in today's world. It's not going away. You'll learn about um, persistent organic pollutants and how even small quantities can wreak havoc in human and animal tissue and cause things as serious as cancer. You'll learn about bioaccumulation being um, how concentration of toxins like pesticides in the tissues of organisms accumulate at successively higher levels in the food chain. And you'll learn that the pesticide pollution problem is very complicated because pesticides also do a lot of good as well as harm to the environment. And then finally, you'll learn about pollution by plastic and marine debris and why it's such a huge concern um, to marine ecosystems. So first of all, um, I don't think I need to spend too much time convincing you that marine pollution is a growing problem in today's world. We're really good at producing a lot of waste. We're not really slowing down. Um, it's part of our culture and it's not changing very fast, though there are some cases where um, changes have been made. There are a few different types of um, pollution. We have chemical pollution. And so in this image here, your chemical pollutants would be, for instance, oil spills, manufactured chemicals, mercury, pesticides. You have trash pollution which here is um, denoted by plastic waste, which is typically the trash that sticks around longest in our environment. So um, it deserves its whole own category. And then you have nutrient pollution, which we won't be talking about today, but we will be talking about in detail um, in later lectures when we talk about ocean dead zones. So today we're gonna to talk about chemicals and trash. Notice on here that I do not have any sort of radioactive chemicals. However, there is a um, highly publicized spill that's currently ongoing in Florida that involves radioactive chemicals. And I really wanted to bring that up today, but I have a couple of really cool activities for you, so I just couldn't fit it in. So we're gonna talk about that in a different lecture. But it's in, the, it's in the news right now. It could be something that's rapidly getting worse over the next couple of days. So yeah, if you, if you hear about that, um, think of us in this class and we'll talk about that later. Yeah, Trash Island. You guys will learn a little bit more about Trash Island um, in this lecture, though I'm sure most of you are familiar with it. Hopefully I can give you a different perspective on it. Okay, so first let's start with this class of chemicals known as persistent organic pollutants. And these are um, known as POPs. They're toxic chemicals that adversely affect human health and the environment around the world. These are a very common type of chemical and they're very, very dangerous. They're usually produced as products or byproducts from industrial processes, chemical manufacturing, and then the resulting wastes from, um, from industry. Though some of these solutions are not waste at all, they're actually final products that work as intended um, that are approved for release in the environment as pesticides. And one example of this is DDT, which we'll talk about in a little bit when we talk about pesticides. But oftentimes they're byproducts. POPs pose a 
particular hazard to humans and to wildlife because of four main reasons. So first of all, they're very toxic. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about what makes them so toxic um, in a few minutes. They're persistent. They don't break down. So they stick around in the environment. They can be trans transferred between tissue and the environment and tissue and the environment back and forth without breaking down, at least not very quickly anyways. Um, they accumulate in the body fat of people, marine mammals, other animals, and they can be passed on from parent to offspring, from mother to, to offspring. And then finally, they can travel great distances on wind and in water currents, which makes any sort of pollution problem not just a problem of that location, but a problem of the whole globe. And so they impact everybody. So they're a huge problem. And um, especially for the most dangerous pops, even small quantities can wreak havoc in human and animal tissue, causing nervous system damage, diseases of the immune system, reproductive and developmental disorders, and cancers. One example of a very, very um, dangerous type of pop are dioxins, which are referenced in this, um, in this comic. And dioxins are one of those that are the most dangerous and um, very, very likely to cause cancer. As a side note, when I was an undergraduate, I worked on a project that was looking at dioxins in the environment. So I don't know. <laughs> I had fun. Probably won't live to be very old, but I had lots of fun doing the project. So. <laughs> so for the honor students um, and then it just if you're curious and you're not in the honors class, let's talk about what makes these pops so to toxic. Um, so when chemicals enter the body, they can interact with proteins and proteins are responsible for doing a lot of the functions that our tissues do. And when these chemicals interact with proteins, they can activate or inactivate them. They can make them do their function or they can make them stop doing a function. So in this case, you can see a chemical is um, attached to a protein and it's activating it. So this protein is doing its function, whatever that may be. And then in this case, the chemical is interacting with the protein and it's turning it off. And so it's inactivating it. So you can have it both ways. And there are additional chemicals that influence protein inactivation or activation indirectly by adding or removing these chemicals. So for instance, a pro uh, chemical might be responsible for this arrow right here that help get this chemical attached to the protein or they might be responsible for removing it. POPs are notorious for doing both of these things. They can attach to proteins and turn them on or off, or they can facilitate other chemicals attaching onto proteins and turning them on or off. And so in this way, they're upright regulating or down regulating various protein activities. And usually these are bad activities. So usually this is at the detriment of the tissue involved. So you can see in this image here um, a bunch of different pathways that these POPs can interact with a whole bunch of different proteins, which are usually like alphabet soup, right? I'm not expecting you to know these, obviously. Um, but these are just different ways that these chemicals can interact with proteins and the types of um, symptoms they produce. So um, cause, causing of cancer, inflammatory diseases, which can often lead to chronic pain, um, metabolic syndromes, diabetes, liver disease, types of cancers of reproductive organs, thyroid disease, dementia. These are all like, you know, the heavy hitters, the things that you definitely don't want. Um, it would be lovely. Maybe, maybe that's how I got my superpowers from working with dioxins. Hmm. Interesting. So, um, so yeah, here, those are some examples of different types of impacts. I wouldn't recommend working with dioxins to get superpowers. My superpower is really lame. It's when I look at a bird, it makes it poop. It's not very useful. You can smell colors. That's probably a more useful, more useful superpower than, you know, looking at birds and making them poop. Alrighty, on that note, while you're thinking about birds pooping, let's go ahead and do a quiz. All right, why do persistent organic pollutants pose a particular hazard to human health and ecosystem integrity? Multiple answers may be correct. Please choose all correct answers.
You guys are on it today. Holy crap. Okay, so everyone's answered. So let's go ahead and close submissions. And the ant, the correct, well, well, back it up. <laughs> the correct answers are A, B, and D. I did too many clicks too fast. Okay, here we go. So A, they're toxic, B, they're persistent, and then D, they accumulate in the body. Um, however, they are not caustic, so they don't cause burns. So most of you got this right. Great job, very good. So let's talk a little bit more about how they accumulate in the body. So um, this process is called bioaccumulation, um, and it's any concentration of a toxin in the tissues of um, organisms that accumulates at successively higher levels in a food chain. And so this image here provides you a diagram of how this can happen. So you can see the phytoplankton might have some of the toxin in them, but maybe they only have like one molecule or, or one unit of toxin. Zooplankton are eating a whole lot of phytoplankton to keep up with their growth and they accumulate a few more um, per animal. Herring will eat the zooplankton, needs a lot of zooplankton, so it's accumulating a lot of toxins. The salmon are accumulating more. And then when we get up to the large mammals like orca whales or, you know, humans, which who eat salmon, um, they're getting a lot of toxin per organism that they eat. And so this is bioaccumulation. And it's definitely a huge problem for us. This is why we have to worry about our mercury intake from, um, from fish. And we'll talk about mercury in a minute. So the increase in the tissues of organisms can, can occur as a result of a couple of different things. So first of all, persistence. So the substance isn't broken down, so it's passed pretty, um, pretty effectively between the trophic levels. Food chain energetics. So the substance's concentration increases progressively as it moves up a food chain because each level of the food chain needs a lot more food to gain a gram of tissue, which is something you should be familiar with from um, intro to oceanography. If they need a lot more, if they need to eat a lot more tissue, then they're also eating a lot more pollutants. And then low or non-existent rates of internal degradation or excretion of the, of the substance. So the organisms can't get rid of it. And this is usually due to the fact that these compounds are water insoluble. Um, so they're not mixing with the organism's um, bloodstream and they're not getting excreted in urine. Instead, they're sticking around and usually attaching to fat molecules um, and staying in the body and staying in the tissue. Example of pollutants that bioaccumulate, these are the heavy hitters. So you can have, um, these are all, all examples of, of POPs. Polychlorinated biphenyls, which are known as PCBs. And an example of a PCB would be dioxin, which I talked about, which is, you know, the thing that gave me my superpowers and will probably kill me in my 70s. Mercury, um, which we'll talk about in a minute. And organochlorine pesticides, for an example, um, DDT, which I'm sure you've all heard of, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute as well. They get their own slides. So mercury. Um, gets its own slide, but this is a um, advanced material. So it's a natural. It's actually a naturally occurring metal. This isn't something that's really created in the lab. Um, it's found in a mineral called cinnabar, which contains a lot of mercury, and people have been extracting cinnabar for a long time. So since at least Roman times, and mercury is released through the natural re weathering of rock like cinnabar and volcanic activity. So there are background levels of mercury in the environment that really don't have very much to do with humans. Um, but the main source of mercury to the environment is from human activity through coal combustion, electrical power generation, and industrial waste disposal. So we add a lot more to the environment than would normally occur due to natural processes. Once mercury is released to the environment, it's um, relatively toxic in that form, but it becomes even worse when it's converted to methyl mercury. Um, which we abbreviate MEHG. And the organisms that do this, and yes, it's an organism that does this, are sulfate reducing bacteria. So if you recall, back when we were talking about salt marshes, we talked about sulfate reducing bacteria as being the ones that are contributing to that 
rotten egg smell because they um, create hydrogen sulfide, which is responsible for that rotten egg smell. But they also do this. They turn mercury into methyl mercury, and this is a more toxic form of mercury. We don't entirely know why they do this. Um, we don't even really entirely know how they do this. We know that they do this, and it's possible, we think maybe a mechanism, maybe a reason that they do it, is that they're using the production of methylmercury as a way to get rid of toxic hydrogen sulfide. So it's essentially a way to detoxify their environment. Um, it's kind of ironic that they're creating something that's way more toxic to the rest of the food web, but um, you know that's, that's the way of things. So essentially by polluting the environment with mercury, our coastal ecosystems aren't doing us a huge service because these sulfate reducing bacteria are actually making the toxin worse. And then a slide on pesticides. So pesticides, as I'm sure you know, are substances used to control pests. Um, it can be insects, um, plants. So if we're talking about aquatic environments, water weeds, um, also runoff from farms, um, and control plant diseases. And so they can um, help us get rid of diseased plants and prevent the spread. Naturally occurring pesticides have been used for centuries. It's not something new that we use pesticides, but it is something new that we're using modern synthetic pesticides. The use of synthetic pesticides didn't begin until the 1940s. And so we're still really trying to figure out the impact of these um, materials in the environment. It's important to note that pesticides are, um, the vast majority of pesticides are really beneficial. So they can protect against forest and farm crop losses. They can aid in more efficient food production, which of course we need because we have a lot of people in the world that don't get enough food. They've also been instrumental in controlling many insect-borne human diseases like malaria, encephalitis, bubonic plague, all the really bad ones. So they have a lot of benefits. They also have some downsides. So disadvantages of pesticides are um, some of them are toxic to humans. Um, many of them are toxic to animals. That's kind of the point. <laughs> Many are toxic to useful plants. Again, it's kind of the point. They kill plants and animals. Um, and the real dangerous ones to the environment persist in the environment. They have a high degree of persistence, and that's what makes them pops. Um, when pesticides enter aquatic systems, they can cause a lot of damage. They can cause fish kills. So there have been examples of massive amounts of fish dying off because of harmful pesticides entering the water die-off of wildlife species, including rare and endangered ones. I know if you've done the reading, you have read a lot about the impacts of DDT to our native bird populations. You probably are aware of this anyways, because it's a very important example of the, how humans can impact the environment. So I'm not going to go into detail on it here, but you, can, you know how pesticides impact wildlife. Um, however, like I said, they're doing a lot of good. So the pesticide problem is really complicated, especially when it comes to something like DDT, which we know has huge negative impacts on the environment, but it's also really, really, really good at controlling mosquitoes. And so in somewhere like the US, where we have a lot of resources to control mosquitoes that are not DDT, and we really, really, um, you know, we have the money to support our conservation efforts in a place like this, DDT is banned but it continues to be used elsewhere around the world because it's a very cheap way to control mosquitoes and mosquitoes cause a massive amount of human suffering. Over 1 million people worldwide die from mosquito-borne diseases every year. And so it's a cost-benefit kind of thing. Do you hold on to, you know, your, um, your top carnivores? Do you really care about maintaining the diversity of your um, falcons and eagles? Or do you care more about saving the people that are dying from malaria in, in your local communities. Um, so it's a tough conversation to have, definitely. We're lucky we don't have to make those decisions here because we have enough money and resources to deal with it, but there are a lot of other people that are not as lucky as we are. Okay. It is 10.52. This um, assignment is a long one. Hopefully you'll find it very interesting. 
Um, I'm going to go ahead and give you until 11. We'll do, um, I'll check in with you at 11.05. Um, we'll see how you're, how you're doing at that point. So go ahead and do work on plastic pollution. I will talk to you guys at 11.05. All right, how are you guys doing? You think I can move on? You guys can still work on this if you want. I only really have one more slide to show you. On the last question, good. Let's do this last slide and then we will move on into the very last activity I have for you. All right, so that activity is probably a little bit of a downer. Um, because you realize how big the problem is and how we aren't really all that close to solving it because the, the major polluters like the U.S. and China are not really engaged in the solution. Um, maybe this administration will change things. Maybe we will become engaged in the solution. But the fact that it hasn't happened when this is such a huge problem, um, it's, it's not very, it doesn't leave me very hopeful. However, there have been success stories. And so even though people cannot return their carts to the structures at grocery stores, um, we have as a culture started to shift away from the use of plastic straws, which I mean, if you had asked me, you know, five years ago, if that would be possible, I would have said no way. That's, <laughs> that's such a pipe dream. Um, but we've done it. So what are some success stories? And why are they so successful? Um, well, the reason is good marketing. So I know I have some journalism folks and some marketing folks in this class um, that may be interested in this type of information. Um, you obviously know people care about cute critters. Uh, that means that people care about pollution, especially when it impacts cute critters. And so the various marketing campaigns that have had that have had a lot of success tackling very specific issues have typically involved some sort of poster child, that's an adorable animal that people love. And so my generation, the big thing were, were soda rings, like the um, plastic rings around soda cans and their impacts on ducks. There was a large campaign to um, use scissors and like snip those rings. I don't know. Do you guys still do that? Because I still do that. Because when I was growing up, that was like a huge thing. Um, yeah, see? So that had a huge impact in our ability to change just a small behavior, but still, it's a big deal. It's a big deal to ask someone to do something every single time they're using a six pack of soda or, or beer or whatever, to ask them to snip the um, plastic. And then your generation has seen um, plastic straws be phased out. And this came about because of a viral video of a marine scientist removing a um, plastic straw from the nose of a turtle. Viral videos are so effective. Um, viral videos of turtles are exponentially more effective. Um, so there can be change. This comes about when a culture decides that there is an issue that is um, possible to tackle and worth tackling. Before this plastic straw phase out, there really weren't that many options in terms of alternatives to plastic straws. After people started to care, there became so many more options. They became much more reasonable to use, um, even though some of them are not, you know, you may not like them as much as plastic straws. They do, the, they do the job. And a lot of big corporations like Starbucks have fully adopted the use of these, um, these devices. It's a huge win. So what's next? Maybe um, mask pollution might be a big one because I'm sure that you've seen a lot of mask pollution around and it's starting to have impacts on wildlife. This image here shows a um, seagull that has its, its feet tied up by a mask. It's definitely not wearing the mask the correct way there. Um, but this might be a new big issue. So that might be something to focus on. Yes, I do this too. I look at trash before I throw it away or even before I recycle it because like, who knows where the recycling is going to end up as you saw in our previous activity. And I'm like, hmm, is this going to be bad for animals? I do too. So that's just, it's just a really good marketing campaign. Um, another thing that might be next is ghost fishing. So that's what the next activity is about. Derelict um, fishing gear and ghost fishing. This image here is of a... Um, 
a derelict crab pot that's full of dead terrapins. And so that, that really, I don't know, tugs at my heartstrings. And so this might be a big issue that could be a campaign that, sa that serves to save a lot of marine life. So for the last nine minutes or so, I'm going to send you off to explore um, ghost fishing and derelict fishing gear in the last activity, Debris Dilemma. And that'll be the end of class. I'll chat with you at 11.20 when the actual class ends, but this is the last thing I have for today. On Friday, if you decide to leave early, on Friday we have an in-class work session, so I will be on Zoom um, to help you all on your final project. So bring any questions and I'll be around to answer them. If not, you can, if you don't have any questions, you can take the day off of class and work on your final project. Okay, it's 11.20, so class is over, but these um, activities will remain up for the next 40 minutes or so. Um, so please feel free to continue on them if you decide that you want to. And uh, hopefully you have a better understanding of the impacts of fishing gear that we leave out in the environment. I know a lot of you fish. This is something that kills a lot of wildlife, and it's definitely something that we can do to help wildlife. There really aren't great um, alternatives for... Uh, like fishing line that will decay over time in the environment. Maybe if we provide more of a spotlight on this issue, more people will be engaged in developing some type of line that will biodegrade. Um, I would be one of the first people to buy it. <laughs> so anyways, I will see you guys on Friday for an in-class work session for your final project. Don't forget that your current event number three is also due on Friday.